Monday, Degenerate Gamblers, welcome back to the Die Hard MMA Podcast. What's going on, everybody? UFC Vegas 89. We're coming off a dub. We got the money chain. We got the Die Hard Stimmy t-shirt. We're feeling good about ourselves. We are now 3-1 and one in the last four weeks after a rough start, after digging ourselves a little bit of a hole. We're chipping we're chipping away. I brought my lunch pail. I brought my pickaxe. And we're just kind of week by week. We're just going at it. We're going to get ourselves right back in the black. I told you guys it was an early start to the year. We got a lot of room to work. And we've still got work to do. But I'm feeling good. Coming off of a seven-unit winning week. And all of that was thanks to our boy, Christian Rodriguez. That's right. And now I know that may be a little bit of a touchy subject for a lot of people. Very, very controversial, my boy, C-Rod, this past week. But, hey, there's something to be said for ride or die. I've always said if you're if you're on a hot streak, if you've got a fighter that's been good to you, every time I pivot and I try to get in front of them and fade them, especially when they're the type of person who figures out ways to win, it just bites you in the ass. I'm going to keep betting C-Rod until it stops working. I'm going to keep betting C-Rod until I stop making money. And I'm damn sure going to keep betting C-Rod when they give me a plus 600 money line between the first and second rounds because I know my guy's got better cardio than anybody out there. Let's freaking go what's going on everybody ethan hershey kicking off the chat with an interesting comment and a bit of a weird one there ethan we'll get to the talbot play i already posted it up it's my first bet of the card um but that's the second time someone said did i hear the pick from lucrative guys i've got a stable of awesome gamblers who are all better than this uh, better at me Better at this than me. There we go. Finally got the words together. They're all better at this gambling thing than I am. They're smarter than I am. They've got more money than I do. I don't subscribe to a single one of their services. I use my own brain, my own analysis. And as always, I DJ in the fuck out and I tell you guys exactly what I'm betting. I had no idea that Lucrative had that as a bet until after somebody else who subscribed to his service posted it now i do talk to people in the dms and every once in a while we we talk a little bit back and forth but 90 percent of the time my card is locked in before that takes place and even if i do talk to people about their bets and we swap information and things like that i still make the decision of my own accord and especially when it comes to my max bets guys this is number nine in five years this is only my ninth ever max bet that i've ever made so no, I'm not just going to, even somebody who I respect and trust like Lucrative, I'm not just going to tail a max bet and give it out as my own. You guys should know better than that at this point. Mushroom MMA, what's going on? My guy Dream in the house. Dick's Insider with the OnlyFans fade report. As always, Billy Q has an OnlyFans. He only ever posted back on 2022. It's free. People are saying that it doesn't count, but he's just letting y'all know. Oh, we got blood money bets in the house. What's up, buddy? Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you tuning into the show. Bufo. On the beat, we got VGO, the grateful dude, Victor De Jesus. We got Catfish, Dilly Joe Free. How's everybody doing? C. Dell, love that all my people are back. What's up, everybody? All right. So, one of the biggest things that we have had going on recently, guys, is uh, since coming over to the home of fight, 
I've been taking way too long. I've been dragging my feet. I know it's the Die Hard MMA podcast for a reason. You guys are diehards. We want to talk fights. We want to get into it. But we've had back-to-back three-hour shows, and I'm not doing that shit anymore. On top of that, my audio platform, I have to cut the episodes in half manually to get them to upload because the file sizes are too big. That's just a little too much. So I'm going to work on shortening the show back down. You know, we used to do like a 45-minute hammered out show audio only when we got started once i brought a guest on we like our talking we go back and forth a little bit and it kind of stretched out to being like an hour 30 something like that and then we started knocking on the door of two hours and you know what i like the hour hour 30 two hour like i don't mind sitting and talking fights for a while but three unless it's like a special card like ufc 299 was it's ridiculous we ain't doing that shit we're cutting it off so Without further ado, I'm just going to bring your guest in, and we're going to go ahead and get the damn thing started. We are joined by another one of the big guns in the MMA betting community, your guy, my guy, our guy, none other than Andrew Gombus. What's going on, my guy? How you doing today? I'm doing well, my friend. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Always a pleasure. It's been way too long since you've shared the screen with me here, so appreciate you taking the time, coming on, and chatting fights with all of us. Um, how'd you do it, uh, last weekend, UFC Vegas 88? So I, I had two bets, one big, one not as big. I lost on Delgarian, um, and I won on Tybior. Uh, Delgarian was a big one. Didn't go my way, but ready to, ready to get back after it this week. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. That's the thing. I was, oh, I was this close. I was this close, man. I've got like a built in personal bias, against Tybura for some reason i had some success fading him by knockout like two three fights in a row a couple years ago when he went on that chinny little streak that he had there for a bit and i've never gotten it back like even this past week i'm like everything is screaming at me to bet marcin Tybura in this spot and i still couldn't do it i passed i was like i've just i gotta stay off it i don't know what it is with that guy man but i gotta i gotta figure that out because he's been printing money for people yeah i mean a lot, I know a lot of people were like, I'm going to try to wait until after round one to get him live. And I was like, if he gets the takedown in the first round, that chance is never coming. And, and sure enough, yeah. that's what happened. I was shocked, man. Like, I, And I almost I almost played him by sub. Okay, all right. Look, I, I don't know, Andrew, if you saw, but every week I do the submission special. And I fumbled the bag last week. I fumbled it badly. Who was because it? I set up, like, going into the fights, I, you know, it's Saturday morning, I'm putting my final piece of the puzzle together, and that's always when I lock in the subspecialist, first thing Saturday morning. I, I wait until the last second to get that three-legger parlay in, and I'm like, I could see a lot of subs this week, man. And I, what I ended up doing is instead of, sometimes I'll do, like, the levels thing, where I'll be, like, two-leg, three-leg, four-leg, and, you know, hope we get all the way down the line. And I was like, I'm just going to round-robin this shit. And I picked, like, six submission legs. And the only one that missed was Chelsea Chandler. But I didn't play the round robin. And I anchored the subspecial parlay on Chelsea Chandler. And the last the last cut, it was either Macy Chase on or Chelsea Chandler. And I went with Chelsea Chandler. We I had a 95 to 1, like just on a silver platter, man. And I picked the wrong final leg. And I didn't do the round robin. I was kicking myself so bad for that one because it was all right there, man. I, I freaking had it. And Tybura, Tybura, GM3, uh, they were all guys that I thought about. I'm so pissed off. <laughs> I mean, and Chandler could have done it. Like She did. It was live for sure. I mean, like, that was a good look. And I guess she broke her arm. I think she broke her arm in, is like, she? the first round or something is what I was hearing. I had no idea. Okay, I, I got to back that up. Somebody DM'd me and said that she, uh, they were reporting that she broke her arm, which frankly makes me feel even worse because she <laughs> had it. <laughs> she could have gotten it. Yeah. But, you know, if she's got a broken arm in that fight, that explains why she didn't keep on going for the grappling and pressing the issue. Um, so for just sure. a bummer, man. I hate so missing those big long shots. I know, man, especially when it's like, it, it's almost better off when, you're not that close, but when you can almost taste it and then it slips right out of your hands. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's like if she got if she got KO'd in round one stiff, I'd be like, ah, we were close. But like the fact that I missed one, I missed two, just my own decision making, and then she had it 
and didn't get it was just max pain man absolutely max pain yeah all right <laughs> so you guys can all have fun laughing at my torture for that one but let's go ahead and get into these fights man ufc vegas 89 a fresh dumpster fire for us to jump into this week these fights man they're gonna be interesting to say the least muhammad uzman comes back here against mick parkin and i've had i've had a bit of a sordid uh past here with these guys Muhammad Usman is a guy that I know you have made some money on, but I have very much been in the camp of I just do not believe in this guy. Like, feel like he's riding the the last name a little bit, riding the coattails a little bit. But the fact is, he's a decent wrestler, and he's got heavyweight power on him. His boxing isn't bad. So, like, I feel like I've been maybe a little bit harsh on Usman going into this whole thing. His last couple fights, I haven't really given him the credit that he deserves. He's 34 years old, though. He is all muscle. And something I think I'm going to mention a lot this week, man, we are seeing the effects of USADA no longer being involved in the UFC. And I think someone built like Muhammad Usman may be a beneficiary of that kind of a situation here. Mick Parkin, 8-0, still undefeated. Uh, I actually doubted him in his last fight, man. He's 2-0 in the UFC. I banked on him hard, cashed big on him in his UFC debut, and then kind of felt like, you know, that recency bias swing when somebody comes in a little under the radar and they have a big win and then everybody's on them the next time out. I'm like, ah, that may be a little too much love for Mick here, but he got the damn thing done. He's a big, strong dude, good cage grappler. He likes to bully people up against the fence and just kind of hang on you and drag you down to the floor. He trains with a, a good gym, a good team, heavy on top position, does a real good job of chain grappling for a big guy like that. He's going to be two inches taller than Usman and, uh, I'm having a tough time with this fight, man. I really am. Because like I said, newfound respect for Muhammad Usman. Doubted Mick Parkin in his last fight. So I don't have a great confident feel on either. Now here they are matched up. I think I've got to pick Mick Parkin. Overall, I feel like he's got the more well-rounded MMA game. But the way these guys both like to cage push and sloppy wrestle, I feel like we're in for just kind of your classic heavyweights leaning on the cage type of uh, affair here between these two guys, man. What are you What are you doing here with this first fight of the night? Yeah, I, I agree with you in the sense I do think it's going to be a close fight. I, I do slightly favor Usman, though. I'm, I'm picking him to win. I just think his – so I – you were right that I did bet him against Tafa before, but I also – bet Collier against him. And I thought that was an impressive performance. I mean, Collier going into that, I was like, he's got the volume, he's got the leg kicks, but Usman, you know, he, he showed me something there and, and parking on the flip side. I, I, I don't think Machado is UFC caliber and part that definitely wasn't an easy fight for parking. Um, I think it's going to, like you said, a lot of cage press. I think Usman's a little bit more athletic, a little bit more explosive. I can't really see parking out grappling him like he did to Machado and you know on the feet that was a pretty ugly look for him neither very good technically like Usman kind of just more relies on physicality but I, I think I, I edge him here because of that um so yeah I I'll pick him to get it done um Usman yeah okay all right yeah so man head to head on this first fight of the night both not overly confident here in this take um yeah, man, I, I could really see this one going either way. This could be just kind of your greasy heavyweight split decision type of thing where I, I could see it being low volume. I could see it being a lot of hugging. I could see it being very sweaty. Uh, but at the end of the day, if one of these guys has the power to shut the lights off with a single bomb, it's probably Usman. So don't hate it. Well, yeah, remember that his first fight in the UFC wasn't going great for him, and he just landed that shot. When, when you're built like that, when you have that much um, – power and explosiveness sometimes all it takes is one even if it's not the prettiest technique absolutely no absolutely if anybody's got the nuclear option in this fight it's gonna be muhammad uzman all right everybody next fight up we're gonna go ahead and talk about igor severino he's taking on andre lima uh, a very very interesting fight that i had to do some legwork on here man these <laughs> this whole card we've got a whole bunch of newcomers to the ufc we've got a whole bunch of contender series debutantes and I know there's a bunch of people out there that do heavy, heavy research on the Dana White's Contender Series cards. I typically just don't have time. So I'm kind of throwing darts on the Contender Series stuff, and I have to really look into them once they get to the UFC. So uh, 
This was this was that card for me. Severino's eight and oh, he's just 20 years old, man. Comes out of shoot the box, and this is his debut off the Dana White's contender series. He's got a 100 percent finish rate, and he showed some real good controlled aggression on Dana White's contender series. Like we all know the shoot the box guys are run face first, right? Leg kick, body kick get in your face, see if they can smash you. That's what these guys do. And he very much embodies that. It just, he slowed it down just a touch. And there were spots where he was countering well and he was fainting to set up his shots well. Classic hard leg kicks. He does force a fight. He does stand right in front of you. Uh, but he does a good job of like covering up and returning fire and countering, which is something I like to see, not just all entirely reliant on his chin here. Um, he's willing to get hit to return a harder shot himself, though, and that's just very much shoot the box. Quick hands, nasty hooks, great killer instinct. The one thing I worried about just a little bit is like on his Dana White's Contender Series spot, he almost gassed himself out looking for the finish. I mean, young kid, 20 years old, bright future, so that's the kind of thing you would hope he'd patch up, but... He was so over aggressive looking for the kill that he had to like reset for a second. And it was a good thing his opponent needed a second to recover also uh, because somebody else with maybe a little bit more experience would have exposed him there. Uh, Severino will have a two inch reach advantage over Lima. Lima is similarly undefeated, seven and oh, 25 years old. So he's five years older. And he's also making his UFC debut off the contender series, some Brazil on Brazil action here. This guy stands extremely tall, I noticed, man. He's got that like upright. <laughs> Irish boxer uh, style striking just kind of stalks his opponents down walks his way into range without really doing much he does a real good job of feinting and then countering once he gets his opponents to kind of open up he's got that stabbing teep kick to the body that he really likes um Big step in elbows, I noticed. He missed a couple of them on Contender Series, but those things are nasty. If he lands one of those, I think it'll do some serious damage. Chopping leg kicks, and you know what? He checks leg kicks really well. It's interesting because both these guys are going to be aggressive. Severino is more offense, and Lima is more defense. It's kind of the way I've figured these two out based on the tape. Um and I'm having a real hard time, again, with this one because I, I want to see these guys in action. Andre Lima is a minus 180 favorite. Uh, Silva is a plus – I'm sorry, Severino is a plus 150 underdog here in this spot. And um, I kind of tend to lean Lima. I know he's a favorite. And especially with double debutants off Dana White's Contender Series, I'm not going to lay this type of number unless I'm absolutely convinced in somebody, unless I've got a real good read on somebody. I'm fairly confident. And I don't have that here in this spot. So I am going to pick the favorite, Lima, to go ahead and win just by being able to probably land the cleaner shots and counter better than his opponent. He'll have the bigger moments, I feel like, if he's able to land cleanly once he kind of you know avoids a shot, rolls and counters, that kind of thing. But this fight could be very close and competitive. And if you want to sell me on Severino, uh, I'm all ears, man. What do you think of the second fight? Yeah, I still have to do some, you know, some grunt work on this fight. But just, you know, looking at their records, one thing I noticed, like right off the bat, is, you know, a lot of these contender series guys, they come into the contender series, they've been fighting guys that are zero and zero, two and one, three and three. These guys have both beaten like some people with, you know, nine and one records, eight and one records. Uh, five and zero records, so I, I'm pretty interested in the fact that it seems like they've been fight. And you know, like I said, I have to do my my due diligence here. But it's the first thing that jumped off the page to me is that both these guys have been fighting what seems to be somewhat legitimate competition, which is encouraging for me. And you know, obviously, both still being young in their careers, one even younger than the other. I'm probably just gonna data gather in this fight, yeah. but yeah. I agree with fully agree with what you said. If someone's coming like laying chalk on someone coming off the contender series, I, I'm with you. I have to be so sure to do it. It almost makes it automatically dog or pass. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that, man, from a betting perspective to say that it's dog or pass. And I think the way you put it, data collection, that's perfect, man. I just I want to sit back, I want to enjoy the violence, I want to see what these two guys have got, and we'll figure out which one is headed where after this fight happens because We've seen so many of these guys come off the contender series. There's a few really legit prospects that have come from that show. And then there's other guys that get to the UFC and they just get dog walked. They just get completely exposed. The last time I really remember like a standout banger of a fight was when they had um, Horegi and Yasmin go at it. And they were like on the main card. And that's where it was like, oh shit, like no. These are both really good prospects, and they set up a banger of a fight right out the gate. 
with this one being so low on the card, I'm not entirely sure it's that, but I could see it being that. So definitely just going to kind of sit back, watch, enjoy, and, and see where this one goes, because this should be a fun fight. Hell of a fight. Maybe some violence. Maybe an under is in order in this co- uh, not co-main event. Jeez. Um, second yes. fight of the night. I don't see a total out just yet. Have you looked at that at all? Um, Let me look right now. Yeah, I got to get bet online opened up here to see what the numbers are offshore. <laughs> It looks like one and a half is um, juice to the over. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yep. I was hoping they slipped up and gave me a two and a half. <laughs> what doesn't go is minus 155. That's not so bad. Under two and a half would probably be like minus 130. Yeah, that's not bad at all. doesn't go at minus 155. That that could have my attention. <laughs> all right, everybody. It is a Monday night, best night of the week, and we've already got over 100 live viewers. I'm joined by my guy, uh, Andrew Gombas, to break down this card. This is the home of fight. Do me a favor. Subscribe if you haven't, please, and just hit the like button for me if you're hanging out here talking fights. We appreciate you. Happy to have you here this evening. Uh, next fight up, we've got Monserrat Rendon. She's taken on Dryda. Zelikova? Zendela? Okay, I'm not. I'm done. <laughs> Dyra, <laughs> we're just going to stick with Dyra. I need to do some work on that one. I need John Anik. you got to tell me how to pronounce that last name. Um, the Z's and the Y's, they just get me, man. Um, this is not, by the way, and I did this last time, this is not Montserrat Ruiz, who I thought it was when I first looked at the name. This is Montserrat Rendon. She is 6-0, and oh, and they call her the monster and rightfully so man Montserrat Rendon is huge she thir- she's 35 years old she just had a birthday just turned 35 but she's massive man she looks you look at her topology picture and she's got like abs popping out of her tank top shirt she's wearing like the camo pants where she looks like she could be like the female assassin in a gi joe movie this chick looks absolutely beastly and she doesn't have enough experience to back that up, in my opinion. At 35 years old, 6-0, and just got your UFC debut out of the way. One by split, by the way. She's big, she's strong, she's physical, and she just doesn't have a whole lot on her strikes. You look at somebody like that, and I- I'm the very first advocate for physicality in MMA, man. If you're the bigger, stronger, more beast of a person, especially in women's MMA, it just tends to pay dividends. Like, these monstrous women... They just win. Like, it's not until, like, a much higher level in the sport that they start getting finessed by people because the lower-level women's MMA fighters just can't handle that kind of strength and physicality. She seems to be able to go out there and still just kind of rely on ragdolling people, dragging them to the ground, being too much for them to handle. But she doesn't have any pop on her punches. She's big, she's strong, but she's slow. And I think she kind of was a little lucky to win her UFC debut. Her opponent here, uh, Dyra, 8-1, and one, making her UFC debut out of Aries FC. She looks like she's exceptionally aggressive, man. She has only one direction, and that's forward. She strikes long. She's got a big push kick that she likes to reset the range with. She keeps a long 1-2 right down the pipe. And she just mauls people. I mean, absolutely. Like, almost blows them over with her aggression. Like she'll mix her range up accidentally and get right in their face and just kind of like tumble both people to the mat. Like she, I'm not entirely sure just how technical she is, but once she gets in her opponent's face, man, she is mean. And when she gets in that grill, she's looking to do damage. She's got heavy, nasty ground and pound. And, uh, she does have one fight that's very concerning where she lost via first round ground and pound. That was very, very uh, recent here. And then she did have a fight, actually one that she ended up winning in the second round where she took this chick down and I'm sorry, she didn't take her down. It was like a soccer mom situation where she couldn't get the takedown. She's like diving in on legs and hips and getting sprawl and brawled. And it was a real bad look for her, man. It was like three years ago, granted, but it, it, I just am not entirely sure where she is at this point in her career. It's hard to find some of the tape on her. She does have a win over former UFC fighter Leanna Joshua. And if one of these women was going to be the prospect, if one of these was going to be the side the UFC wants to see get their hand raised, it's obviously Dyra. She's a minus 175 favorite. Rendon is plus 145. And this is another one where I just do not feel strongly 
I feel like uh, Daira is being put in a situation where she should be able to win, but Rendon's physicality and toughness is going to absolutely factor here based on what I've seen on tape. So unless Daira's made some like big improvements in her offensive grappling game, she might have a hard time getting on top of this chick. And if that's the case, we're in for a close competitive fight. I, I don't like it. What's, uh, what's your read here on this ladies MMA fight, man? Yeah, I mean... It seems like Dyra has has pretty good striking. I, I think it's a huge concern that she, you know, like you mentioned, it, it's only been a couple fights since she got, you know, taken down, mounted, and, and finished in the first round by someone with only a few pro fights. Um, and, and I was annoyed because I almost I, I almost bet Rendon in her last one and I ended up passing, and I regretted it. But th- this is a tough this is a tough one. I, I I do lean Rendon here just because I think she has the upside of, you know, getting on top and has actually fought like in the UFC and has a UFC caliber win. You mentioned her size. Um, and yeah, it just wasn't a good look that Dario was taken down, mounted, finished. Um, Rendon took down Vidal three times. Yeah. Controlled her for a round. So I we know I'm how explosive her. Vidal is. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm picking her, but it's an interesting fight. Like I could, I could see this one going a number of different ways yeah man this one strikes me as that do you remember it was like a year and a half ago where those brazilian prospects just kept coming out of nowhere where like the yeah. tape was awful and then they'd step into the ufc after like a six-month layoff and looked like a world beater like this yep. i'm getting like flashbacks here i feel like this is the fight where we see that again where like this chick looks awful on her regional tape and she looks like she's struggling with these soccer moms who are stepping in the cage and then she comes out here and just like blasts her with a body kick and like puts her down or something i don't know (laughs) obviously no no bettable information there like no no real concrete to back that up but i just have a bad feeling about that like rendon wins a greasy split decision in her last fight i think some people might end up on that side and feel bad about it. So I'm, I'm passing, man. This is, I hate to say it guys. I loved last week's card for betting. There was lots of really bettable fights on last week's card. We talked about all of them. We did. Okay. And then this week it's really bettable lines again, but some of these fights are gross, man. Like I, I, even though it's like good lines, I don't know who to put my money on. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm not a fan of this one. I'm absolutely staying off this fight. Another, uh, take notes. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Next up, we've got Steve Wynn. He's taking on Jarno Aarons. And now we can now we've got a little data. Now we've got a little information. We we can talk about this one just a tad bit, man. Um, what we've got here in this spot is Steve Wynn, who's nine and one, finally, finally making his UFC debut, man. They gave this guy three cracks at it, three shots at Dana White's contender series. Now I still have to put more legwork into what I think might be some kind of an angle that I just haven't ironed out yet, man. I have a very poor opinion of fighters that have gone on Dana White's Contender Series twice. If they need that second effort to get signed by the UFC, unless unless it's a Bo Nickel, you know, unless it's somebody who needs the experience because they're too young, but they're going to be a stud, they're going to be a superstar, you know, some something like that. Um, they don't count. The guys who actually get on the contender series and struggle, they win a decision, it's not impressive enough, yada yada, they get another shot and they still don't, you know, get signed until that second attempt. This guy took 3 times. And I just don't think they're cut out for it. I think those are the guys that are going to struggle in the UFC. And the fact that it took him 3 shots to get into the UFC on Dana White's contender series, I personally just already am biased against Steve Wynn. He's fighting out of Fortis MMA. He does have nice rangy footwork. I will admit that. He keeps a high shell. He explodes in with a long jab. He works really well behind that jab. That is something that I like to see. And he invests in those calf kicks. He's got very accurate hands. And he did put that on display in his last fight on Dana White's Contender Series. The thing is, they were talking on the Contender Series episode, Bisbing and them, they're, they're going off about how he needed to come out with a killer instinct. He needed to come out and really show something, show he's got that that killer, that finishing instinct, you know, go out there and get a big win. And man, the, the ref stepped in to like save the guy he was fighting. It wasn't even like he did anything to like stand out or put the guy down. 
Um, AJ Cunningham was just kind of plotting his way forward and eating damage the way he does in every single fight he's ever had. I mean, he just made his UFC de debut against Luke Dovic Klein. And he's the guy that got knocked out in the first round because he just walks forward. Now on the regional scene, when you're fighting guys who are eight and 10 and six and four, that is probably going to work fine because those guys are terrible and they can't overcome your stupid level of durability. But against anybody who's half decent, they're just going to piece you up. And, and that's what was happening in this spot. Steve Wynn didn't, in my opinion, didn't earn that knockout, man. I, I feel like he was almost gifted that knockout by the, uh, by the official. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, Cunningham was, his face was busted up pretty good, but so was Steve Wynn's. Like, it's not like, he, that wasn't a clean performance. He took a decent amount of damage in that fight as well. Long story short, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed with Steve Wynn. Jorno Aarons, 13-5-1. Uh, He's on an 0-2 UFC run. He landed roughly 20 to 30 significant strikes. Uh, I'm sorry, 20 and 30 significant strikes in his first two UFC fights. He does a good job of like dancing around. I like his footwork and his movement and stuff like that. But man, he just does he just doesn't throw enough, man. Like that's the big problem with him. He he has zero ability to grapple. He gives up his back every time they get into some kind of a, a grappling exchange. He got absolutely dominated by William Gomi. And that's a that's a spot that, you know, I'm again another guy that I'm just kind of lukewarm on is Gomi. Um, he wasn't hardly able to touch. Sung Wu Choi. That was straight up embarrassing. Like, he, man, he was throwing like spinning back fists and flying knees just to get into range with Choi. He, he literally had, now I, I'm no Muay Thai expert, right? Like I've only ever hit a punching bag in my life. So I'm not trying to shit on the guy, but he didn't have the ability to close the distance to get to Sung Wu Choi. He couldn't touch him with his footwork and his movement. So he resorted to low low percentage strikes like spinning shit and flying knees just to get close to him. Big red flag, man. I, I couldn't in my lifetime ever put my hard-earned money on Jorno Aarons after seeing that last fight. I think this is a setup spot for Steve Wynn. He's minus 190 at this point, and that's a gross number for a guy like this. And even though this is like a Dana White's contender series fade spot, right? Where we've got a guy with UFC experience, even losing experience, who sits as an underdog to the debuting fighter. Jarno Aarons is the kind of guy who's going to go 0-4 in the UFC and they'll say thanks for uh, boosting a couple resumes, kid, and, and kick him to the curb after he's done there. He's not the kind of guy I'm looking to fade anybody, really, with. I, I just don't think Jarno Aarons is going to be able to get by the jab of Steve Wynn. Um, picking, picking Steve Wynn for this one, man. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I faded Aaron's in his last one. I, I'm not fading him here, but I am picking when to get it done. I just think he's better technically, and I quite frankly don't think Aaron's is UFC caliber. I, I'm not even really convinced that Win is either, but I, I just think he's the better fighter. I think he's better technically, um, more tools, like just a more sharpened skill set. Um, yeah, it, you're playing a dangerous game, laying this kind of chalk on him for sure. But I, I'm not really interested in the underdog here. It would, ha it would have to be wider for me to, to take the shot because I, I don't think Aaron's skill-wise is going to be enough to – you kind of have to bat, like weigh it out, right? Like, okay, this is what I see with my eyes. This is what their experience tells me. This is what their stats tell me. This is what their um, – what like certain you know matchup trends tell me. But there's just nothing really – to break it down as simply as possible. There's nothing that really tells me Aaron's is UFC caliber. There's mm -hmm. nothing really to back him up here. So uh, I, I'm picking win, but I'm passing. Yeah, man, this one, I mean, this one seems like almost like your regional scene, t scene type of yeah. booking where one guy is headed towards contender series. And the other one is like your, you know, your journeyman dude fights on the weekends, but he's a teacher the rest of the time. That kind of, you know what I mean? Like, even though win is a bad fighter, like minus 190 might be short. <laughs> He might he might look like a minus three hundred favorite here in this spot, just the way the way this thing is uh, is looking to me. Yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me, but I'm definitely not going to pay to find out when he's this um you know he's implied to be like sixty something percent, and it's like how much can you really how much of an edge could you really even have there? Just given the fact that he's not like a prolific offensive grappler and you yeah. know, he hasn't fought that level of competition. So it's just an all around pass for me. Yeah. It's gross, man. It is gross. Like Speaking that. of gross, 
a gross infection. My guy here in the chat says, I'm behind. YouTube isn't notifying me anymore. Hit the bell, man. We're on a new... I don't know if you've hit the bell on the new platform because this is home of fight. If that is why, maybe you're missing out on the notifications because you're back on Pub Sports Radio uh, still and, and waiting for it there. We ain't there anymore. We're on a different channel now. <laughs> um all right ethan agreeing with me here the fight is called a dumpster fire absolutely that's what we do and mushroom says uh fgtd fight goes to disappointment absolutely could not agree more my man all right we are burning our way straight through this one man because unfortunately some of these fights suck next up we've got miles johns and he's taking on cody gibson finally we've got something we can get a little excited about we had some more data to work with in our last fight this is one we can actually talk about man miles johns 13 and 2 and i always seem to end up on the opposite side of this guy i've been i've been called a hater I, people don't get it like I, I don't know what it is i'm just not a miles johns believer man and, and i've successfully been on the other side of him a couple of times and i've been on the other side of him incorrectly you know a couple of times but i just don't trust the guy he is two, three, and one in his last six fights, that one being a no contest. We'll get to that. He's an explosive wrestle boxer, almost kind of a bit of a throwback fighter. He's really good everywhere. Physically strong, good wrestling. He throws big looping hooks, big power right hand, overhand fastballs. He struggles to maintain a pace for 15 minutes, though. He comes out hard. He comes out fast. And it's like if he, he wants to kill you in the first four minutes of the fight. And if he doesn't manage to kill you, he hopes he's got enough le gas left in the tank to just kind of smother you with his wrestling. And some of these guys, he's been able to actually get out of there later, you know, round three, stuff like that, because they just can't keep up with that kind of a grappling pace. So, I, I, man, I know he's got round three finishes, and that's a thing a lot of people point to to like defend his cardio and stuff like that. And to me, it's almost a weakness of his opponents more so than it is a strength of his that's leading to some of those finishes. Now, regardless, he's getting them. So I, I might still be cutting the guy a little bit short there, but I don't think he's got a great gas tank. USADA is going to be a massive talking point in this fight here for me, man. It's a big, big one for me because that no contest of his in his last fight was overturned because he popped. Uh, let's see. What what was it? Um, I wrote it down here. Do, 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 do. Tyrannibal. So he popped for Tyrannibal, and it was over Dan Arweta. Now, I made a big bet on Dan Arweta in that last fight because I looked at this and I went, you know what? I've seen what happens when Miles Johns gets pushed by somebody who has great cardio, someone who can you know compete with him in the grappling, and it's not pretty. I think Dan Arweta is going to knock this guy out as soon as he gets tired. The problem was he never got tired. In fact, he ate some shots that were like straight up knockout blows and his recoverability was fantastic. It was absolutely phenomenal how he managed to get his feet back underneath him after taking some skull crushing shots from Dan. Now, lo and behold, he pops just a little bit later, and it's turned over into a no contest. And I mentioned on Twitter that I was not so surprised by that. And he actually, he went after a lot of content creators on Twitter, myself included. He like replied to the thing, screaming from the rooftops that he's innocent and you saw to change the way that uh, the commission changed the way they were like measuring, you know, these things because fighters like him who are truly innocent were getting caught by the, apparently he's got like the John Jones picogram things going on where it's like flaring up every once in a while. And that's what's causing him uh, to be, you know, registered as having a, a performance enhancer in his system. When in fact, he's not actually taking it. I'll be honest with you, Andrew. I try not to like piss UFC fighters off all that much and try not to be too clickbaity uh, with the clips that I put up unless I'm feeling really strongly about a take, but I never believed the bullshit with the picograms. Not once in my life did I ever take that and be like, yeah, that makes sense. Like you got that shit in your system somehow. Okay. I don't care how many Olympic sized pools of blood you have that those picograms are floating around in. You've got fucking Tyrannoball in your system, yeah. and it got there somehow. And you had a performance that looked very drastically different from some of the other performances that you've had in the past. And you expect me to believe that one plus one doesn't equal two. Like, you saw it as gone now, and Miles Johns is exactly the kind of guy that I've got circled right now because I want to go, what does he look like? 
We just saw OSP turn back the clock last week and look like an absolute beast against Kennedy. Now, I tried to warn everybody not to parlay up Kennedy because you can't trust the man's chin, but that's not the way I saw him losing that fight. I thought, if anything, he'd get clipped by, like, a stray front kick or some shit. I never thought OSP would go out there and finesse Kennedy and Chukwu for 15 straight minutes and get a decision victory over him. That's not what I expected to happen. His team in his corner, they're all yelling about how he's ready now. He looked better now. His, I, well, guess why he looked better now? Like, he, that man has looked like dust for the last two, three years. USADA's gone, and all of a sudden, OSP looks like he's in his prime again. Man. Uh, El Chapo is the kind of guy that I'm looking at very closely and being like, all right, Yuzada's not involved as much. He might he might look a little better. Now, I, I spent way too long on that. But Cody Gibson, 19-9, 36 years old. He lost on the tough finale to Brad Katona. Con counting his first run in the UFC, he is 1-4 in, in the UFC overall. His first run, though, decision loss to Aljamain Sterling. KO win over Johnny Bedford. He got subbed out by Manny Gamburian. That's a throwback name right there. And then he did drop a decision to Douglas Silva de Andrade. So honestly, man, when he fought those guys, it's not a bad run. You know, Manny Gamburian, Douglas Silva de Andrade, Aljo, like, they were all solid fighters back in their day. So it's not a shame to have lost to a bunch of those guys cody gibson's got a big frame lots of forward pressure very heavy on his feet he strikes long and he hits hard he's just a little stiff for me though it seems like he doesn't have the ability to like move or counter or evade uh he ducks his head in bad bad when he's coming forward man i i hate to say it even though he's got a five inch reach in this spot i think cody gibson's gonna be a sitting duck he's just such a marauder he's so heavy on his feet he couldn't find brad katona in there the athleticism and speed difference the footwork it had him unable to really catch the guy and i think miles johns can do a lot of that in this spot and i think miles johns hits a hell of a lot harder than brad katona does on top of that we've seen him with those knees up the middle we've seen him with that absolutely like soul snatching uppercut the way cody gibson dips his head i think miles johns is going to knock him out you want you want to hear a funny story just in regard to the whole picograms thing and how everyone has these excuses you'll, you'll get a kick out of this there, there's a kid in college wrestling i won't mention his name but a few years ago he um popped for something and his excuse was that he went into the fridge and accidentally drank his dad's protein shake so he blamed his dad, who like isn't a competitive athlete, and um, said that he took a took a sip of his dad's <laughs> protein drink without realizing. Dad's so I him for fun, huh? Yeah, I, I always find that kind of stuff funny too. But in regard to this fight, it, it's a pretty good. You know, we talked about some fights, and it's like, eh, th this one I think should be fun. You know, like regardless of outcome. Um, Gibson was just in a, a firefight with Katona. They both put up a ton of volume. I think they landed like combined three hundred something strikes. Um, Miles Johns, I bet him in, as an, I bet him as an underdog in his last one. It, it, it's a good fight. It's a close fight. I, I see some advantages, like some different types of advantages for both of these guys from like a macro level. I think Gibson is you know noticeably bigger. He's longer. Yeah. Um, Miles Johns is pretty significantly younger than Gibson. They both have meaningful experience. I, I just see it kind of being a, a good fight. Both guys pretty well-rounded i, I kind of lean gibson i like his size i think if he gets on top he probably has a better shot at controlling um john's on the mat i, I like his body triangle obviously we didn't see it. it it could end up being a war like his last fight but i'm gonna pick him to get it done here but john's is a guy that i've backed in the past i think he's tough i think he's well-rounded but I, I i'm gonna go with gibson on this one okay all right, fair enough, man. So we're we're leaning opposite sides here on this one right now. Miles Johns is about a minus 150 favorite. You can get plus 125 on Cody Gibson. And uh, I actually wouldn't hate a violence look on this one, man. Under two and a half, plus 145. Like I mentioned, I, I think Gibson's going to be there to get hit and potentially knock Miles Johns out. And we have seen Miles Johns finished a couple of different times, once by KO, once by sub. And as I mentioned previously, I think Dan Arweta should have probably knocked him out in that last fight if all things were fair and true. Um, Cody is a, a pretty solid finisher himself, man. He's got seven KO wins and four by sub. So I, I definitely think there's finishing upside on both sides of this fight. 
and it should just be a banger. I, I'm with you. I, I don't. I, you're not going to catch me betting on on Miles Johnson in this type of a spot, especially after all the shit that I've talked about him. So I'm picking him to win. Uh, but if anything, I'm probably betting an under on this one. Cool. Yeah, I don't hate it. I like it. I like it. All right. We've got Adolfo saying I'm late, but see rod that's what's up we got my guy in here bro some dad thanks for the stimmy check love the new home love you too homie appreciate you being here i know that's not what you said but i'm gonna turn it into that <laughs> evan saying gibson late round props for me and i don't mind that look whatsoever those will be probably pretty juicy pretty juicy um let's see here gibson going from davy grant to miles johns is a gift yeah davy grant where'd you get davy grant was that a canceled fight was he matched up against Davy Grant? Let me let me pull Tapology up real quick because I didn't realize that he was, yeah, he was he was he was originally canceled to fight Davy Grant who withdrew, and it looks like Miles Johnson's coming in on this one. I did not catch that. All right, good to know. That's what the chat's for. Thank you guys. What is up? Let's freaking go, Dixon Cider. Thank you very much, my friend. Hit the like. All right, let's get after it. Okay. So the next fight up on the docket, man, Ricardo Hamos taking on Juicy J, Juliana Rosa. And, ah, oh, God, he's got to fix this picture, man. Ricardo, Ricardo, please. You've got a mustache and a beard. You're a full-grown-ass man. Update the topology picture. I know the fighters have to, like, email and ask themselves to get that shit done. But it's about time, my guy. It is definitely time to get this one updated. This is a fun fight, man. Hamos is 16 and 5, 28 years old. He's had a bit of a tough uh, slid here in the UFC recently. 2 and 2 in the last four. Julian Arosa, 28 years old. I'm sorry, 28 and 11. Geez, mixing up my numbers here. 34 years old. So he's getting up there. There's going to be a six year age gap between these guys. And honestly, I can keep it short on Julian Arosa, man. This guy's my favorite glass cannon. He can't take a punch. And I talked about it. It's so funny. That run that he went on where he put some big wins together. Um, Charles Jordan, Ocho Peterson, Hakeem Dwadu. Everyone could not wait to like pile in on this guy. And I'm sitting here going, guys, don't do it. He's chinny. I thought Charles Jordan for sure was going to chin him. I thought Nate Landwehr was going to chin him. He got Nate out of there in 56 seconds, though. Didn't have time to really get that one done. Um, so and now kind of the, uh, the bill has come due. It, it's finally come back around. He's been knocked out in back-to-back -back fights. Sure, Nate Landwehr and Charles Jordan can't knock him out, but freaking Alex Caceres can in round one. Like, that's the kind of guy you're dealing with in Julian Arosa. He's got A-plus offense and will go out there and kill pretty much anybody if he's the one that gets off and then he's got like d minus durability he can't take a punch from hardly anybody and then you've got fernando padilla who put the nail in the coffin i love that spot for my guy padilla uh round one big punch put him down that's it it's over it's done now ricardo hamos he is a guy that i'm a little concerned about as far as his durability as well i love his frame he's tall he's long Big, long kicks, likes to keep people at range and distant. He's actually got decent wrestling on him, good takedowns. And he does well when he mixes in those uh, those grappling exchanges. Solid top game. He did leave his neck hanging out there, and Charles Jordan snatched it, took it home, and said, okay, thank you, uh, and, and then ran off and, and did his thing up there with his uh, with his stepsister. <laughs> I don't know if you guys follow Jordan, Charles Jordan on social media. He's actually hilarious. Um, but he, uh, Ricardo almost just doesn't seem to do well in the chaos, man. Like, Charles Jordan is the type of guy that forces and thrives in the chaos. You could say Julian Arosa to some extent does that too. But Ricardo Hamos is a guy that likes to keep it nice and clean. He's he's good with his timing. He's good with his distance. And when he fought a guy like Zubair Tahugov, he had a lot of success in the striking realm with that kind of a guy. He's got this beautiful spinning elbow that he absolutely um, murdered. What, uh, Chavez, I think was the, yeah, Chavez was the guy that he caught with the spinning elbow and just absolutely melted him. He hurt to who got with that thing badly. He was on shaky legs after eating it. it it's a really good finisher uh, from Ricardo Homo. So he's got that timing in the space and the distance set up for it really, really well. He kind of reminds me of a young Charles Oliveira. I worry a little bit about the durability but that doesn't mean you can't go off and rattle off a bunch of wins and be spectacular at what you do. He just puts himself in damaging situations where it's high risk, high reward, and you got to kind of love the guy for that. I think this is a Ricardo Homo spot. I mean, maybe 
Juicy J stops the bleeding with a big finish here. Maybe he makes it a little bit too nasty, and Ricardo Hamos can't quite keep up and can't keep pace, and he gets caught in some kind of a transition. And it, that's all very possible here to me, man. But at the same time, at the end of the day, I feel like Ramos can probably find a way to touch Julian Arosa. And if he does, I think he only needs one extremely volatile fight here. Um, I will pick Ricardo Hamos in this spot, but low confidence as far as putting a bet on it. And for some reason, did, um, let's see here. We've got Ricardo Hamos as a minus 150 favorite in this spot. You can get plus 130 on Juicy J. Couldn't find the fight there for a second. I thought the line was wider than that. Um, talk to me about this fight, man. What are you doing here? Yeah, it's really interesting because I feel like Arosa, to your point, is a little bit more of a durability issue. Where I feel like Hamos, it's more of a mental issue. Mm. The skill, the skill sets there for both guys. I mean, like yeah. both the like when Hamos puts it together, man. Like he's good jujitsu. He's a crafty striker. You know, he's dangerous when he gets the back. Arosa. He's a, he's a, he could strike, he could grapple, he's a finisher. I mean, he finished Charles Jordan, he finished Sean Woodson, Nate Landwehr, but he gets knocked out in his last fight against a guy in Fernando Padilla, who's also on this card. Who like I felt like Arosa had all the tools to win that fight, but it's just it's just one of those things where you know he gets hit and and he wobbles a little bit. It, it's a high variance fight, but I, I'm gonna side with Arosa here just because I, I I trust him more like from. Uh, a mental perspective and when you have two guys that both have the skill because i do think both guys have the skill i i, I think arosa has a little bit more of a better process where almost you know he has some flashy kicks some spinning elbows he could catch anyone with them but i do trust arosa's process more and i i think he's just mentally mentally tougher and, and it's something that kind of flies under the radar but if you take a look at ricardo hamos's career like you know he he beats the guys in pretty convincing fashion that he's supposed to be like Danny Chavez. He finished him in a minute. Eduardo Garagori, like just not on his level at all as a grappler, but like, when does he really overcome adversity? Like, especially over three rounds, like he lost the decision to, to Kugov. He lost to Lerone Murphy, lost to Saeed, lost to Jordan. Like the way he, it's not even that he lost to Jordan in the last one. It's like the way he lost to Jordan. Yeah. To me, just that was like, his neck in there. It was like really like like that's how you're gonna go out against a guy who, in theory, you should be able to take his back. Like you're you're way better than him at jujitsu. So to me, it's more of like a mental lap. So I'm picking a Rosa here to get it done. I like I also you know we mentioned his durability a number of times now. I like that he took a year off after getting uh, knocked out or TKO'd. I should say in his last fight because he, he didn't get knocked yeah. out, but you know he took the time necessary to recover. Um, it's always possible he gets finished, especially given the fact that Hamos has crafty techniques, given the fact that Erosa is susceptible to being knocked out. But skill for skill, process, I, I, I favor Erosa here. Okay. All right. Another one. Man, we're just going head to head on this whole card. It's a good thing I don't have many bets on this one because uh, I don't, I, I don't I have feel... any yet. I have yeah. zero so far. So we'll see. I've got one. <laughs> I've got one. Cool. So I, I would feel real nervous right about now if i had like six bets and you and i are just head to head on every single spot on the court <laughs> yeah so, I've, I've got a couple on mine but you know it, there's not gonna be any smash spots for me this week but i, I think there's some good angles so you know we'll, we'll keep chopping through them yeah i don't mind it man uh, ricardo hamos it looks like ko prop plus 250 that's the kind of spot where just kind of you know almost a system play against julian arosa i'd be interested in maybe taking taking a shot at some knockout prop there in that spot. Cause like you mentioned, he doesn't, he's not really built for war, right? He's not going to come back from a losing spot. He's either going to go out there and, you know, flash KO the guy, or he's, he's probably going to end up getting grinded on and finished himself later in the fight. Similarly, you could look at a Rosa um, by sub. I don't feel like juicy J ever gets enough uh, credit for just how good his submission game is and the way he kind of beats people into giving up. Um, looks like that's plus 575. That's another spot where I, I wouldn't mind a look. I feel like it's Ricardo Ramos early or Juicy J late. That's kind of the way I think I'd sum this one up. I could get on board. You know, Juicy J round three submission, I feel like, is always, always a good look for um, for his fights. I, I feel like he's done that a few times. Let me look really quick while we're on the subject. Yep, yeah, that, Jordan, he got Jordan in one. I know that. 
Sean Woodson round three sub. Oh so, yeah, the Woodson one. Maybe he gets it again. I mean, like I said about Ricardo Ramos, his jiu-jitsu is very good, but we saw a mental lapse against Charles Jordan. And like, and if that if Juicy J, you know, gives him a war through three rounds and he wants out in round three, I can see it. And he does a whole lot better with a wide variety of offense. Like Charles Jordan's got a hell of a gilly on him, but Juicy J can hit all kinds of stuff. So, you know, you're going to be looking at uh, like the high elbow guillotine. You'll be looking at Darces, Anacondas. He's got those long arms. Like he, he's got a lot more options to hit something yep, from those positions. Sure. So I, I don't mind that look whatsoever. We may have to look at the uh, round three sub when it opens up here stateside. All right, everybody. Next fight, we got Trey Ogden. He's taking on Kurt Holiba, and I've got such a nasty taste in my mouth, Andrew. I, I hate what happened to me, myself, personally, <laughs> in Trey Ogden's last fight. I am so freaking annoyed with the Moda fight. Uh, Trey Ogden, 16-6. and six, He's 34 years old, and I got robbed, man, absolutely robbed. He was beating the brakes off of Nicholas Mata, and he went to go and tap this guy out late in round three. Mata was dead tired. The ref thought he tapped, stepped in, stopped the fight. Early stoppage. I mean, that's one where like, ah, uh, you gotta, you gotta feel for Moda to be like, okay, like maybe you didn't deserve a stoppage loss, but your ass was getting kicked. Like you should have lost the fight. I should have cashed my ticket, uh, but none of that happens. And uh, here we go again. Get you know, got to kind of hit the reset button. The thing I like about Trey Ogden is that he's extremely cerebral. He's so smart. He's very good at game planning, and he always comes correct when he gets into these spots. He's very risk adverse. That was something that uh, I was a little frustrated by in the Bahamondes fight because I took Bahamondes inside the distance. And what we learned is that Trey Ogden's not the type of guy to try to catch up from behind. He will not extend himself and put himself in a position to be hurt or injured trying to come back in a fight. He'll just kind of shell up and take the L and drag the fight to a decision, taking as little damage as possible. And Looking for a finish, it kind of takes two people to get in there and trade, right? Like you can't have somebody who's just focused on defense. It's very hard to get that guy out of there, especially when they're a good fighter uh, like Trey Ogden and not like a, a regional scene fighter that's just a bum. So I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on what Trey Ogden is at this point. He's got a very good and underrated grappling and submission game. People probably know about it now because of the Moda fight. That's going to be very recent in a lot of people's minds. But he's got 11 wins by submission. So he's a guy that will find that gap and then expose it, use it to his advantage, and he'll tap people out on the ground if he can. Ogden will have a two-inch reach advantage in this spot. Kurt is 20 and 7. He is coming off beating my guy Austin Hubbard to claim the Ultimate Fighter Championship at UFC 292. Kurt is 37 years old, so he's three years older in this spot. And honestly, I shortchanged the guy, man. I really did. Um, he had a pretty pretty interesting run on the ultimate fighter where i just straight up didn't believe like jason knight is is a diaz bro he's a guy a lot of people like he's a fun fighter there's some kind of hype around him because he gets in there and brawls and he's just not good he's just never been good and and i don't have a good opinion of him so the fact that kurt hollibaugh had his career best fight against jason knight i just kind of went Psh. <laughs> you know, of course he did. Why wouldn't he? Of course he's going to kick Jason Knight's ass. He should. So I didn't really expect much of him coming into the Austin Hubbard fight. And he did fantastically, man. Uh, Austin Hubbard came out and did exactly what I thought he would in round one. Everything looked like it was smooth sailing. And then Holobo just refused to fuck off. And he came out and beat the brakes off of Hubbard like he stole something in the second round and got a finish. I mean, beautiful roll off of his back to hit that triangle choke. I like this guy's combos. He's big. He's surprisingly fast for his size. He's got a good jab on him, solid power, solid cardio as well. And, you know, kind of notable by these round two, round three finishes. He looked career best at 37 years old, and he took on a young guy who's a bit of a cardio machine in his last fight doing it. So I have newfound respect for Kurt Hollibaugh coming into this fight. Now that said, I still think I'm higher on Trey Ogden and I think I'm higher on Trey Ogden's brain more so. This to me is like, this is chess versus checkers, right? I think Kurt Hollibaugh is going to have the more finishing upside. He's going to be the bruiser. He's going to be physically stronger. He's probably going to hit harder, but Ogden's going to be the guy with the better game plan. Ogden's going to be the guy uh, that studies more and finds the weaknesses and fights behind the jab. And because of that, I do lean towards Trey Ogden. It's probably a decision 
Um, but I think over, and I think the short price on Ogden, I'm actually tempted on. Minus 148 is what I'm seeing on Trey Ogden, the dog, Kurt Holaba, plus 125. Um, and yeah, I, I would look to go back to it with Trey, even after the way that last fight ended. What about you, man? Yeah, you, you got robbed for sure, man. That sucked. I, I had nothing on it, but it was like the, the fight was over. It, it was, was done. E it was a it was an easy fight. I shouldn't say an easy fight. It was a clear fight. You know, Ogden well on his way, but it, it just didn't work out. And, Those are the uh, ones you never get back, man. <laughs> no, and, and it's unfortunate for sure. Um, in this matchup, this is an interesting one. I, I feel like Hollow Ball is kind of a tough matchup for Ogden. I, I like you, you know, I have respect for Austin Hubbard. I think he's a pretty like he's a decent fighter, you know. Getting a win over him, I think, is solid for Hollow Ball. He's Tough to grapple. He's pretty well rounded. He's just all around tough. Ogden, you know, he's another one of those guys. I feel like the market's riding a little high on him right now. He, you know, he had the good performance over Mata, who he's just better than. He's a better grappler than him. Um, the Baja Mendes fight, it was kind of just really one thing happened that fight. Baja Mendes just kicked his leg and kicked his leg and kicked his leg. And there was really nothing he could do. The Zell Huber fight still makes me laugh to this day. I, Zell Huber just still never left the locker room for that fight. I kind of feel like that was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Then the Levitt fight drives me absolutely bonkers because I bet him against Jordan Levitt. And Jordan Levitt landed, let's see, he landed six strikes to the head the entire fight, got controlled for over a minute, and got the decision. Anyway, I, I'm – Getting off topic here, <laughs> Hollabaugh, you know, like I said, he, he's just a solid guy. And if you look at his first run in the UFC, his losses were to Hione Barcelo, Shane Burgos, and Tiago Moises. So it's not like he's out here looking losing a bums. He, he had a pretty tough run. I'm, I'm glad he was able to, you know, kind of get through that redemption series, get back to the UFC, get that win. Um, and, and I'm going to pick him here as well. I, again, it, it's a good fight. It's a tough fight. But I think this is a good time to sell – Trey Ogden high after a couple of good performances in a row. So I, I'm picking Holaba. That's fair, man. That's fair enough. Like I'm kind of glad we're on opposite sides. Everyone in the chat is going to get like both views of every single fight and you guys can make your own damn choices. I haven't bet any of these. So that's the kind of yeah. fight we're dealing with. Uh, there's an argument to be made for every single fighter on this card. I think so. Uh, definitely going to be interesting to see how a lot of these play out and we got some badass cards coming right down the pipe, guys. So don't blow your wad trying to gamble this weekend unless you feel real good uh, about it because this is definitely going to be uh, one of those wild fight nights. I, I felt like we were going to see some chaos last week and classic UFC style. I could not have chosen the chaos we were going to see, but we did indeed get a wild night. So watch out for this dumpster fire, folks. Uh, real quick, got to shout out a couple of things. First and foremost, guys, um, if you like the show and you want to support me directly, one of the best ways you can do it is by grabbing a shirt or something like that. Um, I do have this uh, spread shop up if you guys want to come. And especially if you cash a huge bet with me, a live bet on uh, C-Rod or you're tailing the max bet, get yourself an always trust your balls uh, shirt on the side and rock here with me next up obviously this is the home of fight please make sure you follow us on all the socials guys we are building an army here this is going to be an awesome awesome platform for us and please join the discord i'm going to go ahead and stick the link here in the chat um we obviously have a free discord where you guys can just kind of come hang out and chat and you guys can find me in there i'm going to be a lot more active in this discord moving forward if you're interested uh my stuff is always free as always but there are some guys in here that do sell action and paid picks and Derek Brunson's in the chat, stuff like that. If you want to check out the premium section, use promo code diehard for $5 off that premium subscription. But if nothing else, like I said, just come join the free one, come hang out and have some fun with us. Next up is Spectation Sports, uh, Regional Scene MMA, Maverick MMA 27, and All in Combat coming up this month. These are the shows where you're going to learn about the fighters that are going to be on Dana White's Contender Series. If you're not getting enough MMA action in your life, check out Spectation Sports. There's something almost every single weekend, and uh, promo code DIEHARD is going to get you 20% off on Spectation Sports as well well oh man all right they're telling me the discord link is invalid i do apologize guys i will hit up the people uh the powers that be and i'll make sure to go ahead and get a new discord link for you guys i do apologize 
for that. Um, bet openly, though, you guys should know about it at this point in time. Uh, this is the best thing ever. I love it for MMA. You're getting better lines on bet openly than literally anywhere else because it's an exchange. That means an actual human being on the other side of the fight is taking your action, but it gives us better numbers on everything the way it should be minus 133 on miles johns plus 133 on cody gibson you can't beat either of those anywhere so if you guys want to save some money uh you know you're paying essentially one percent if and only if you win your bet as opposed to laying the minus 110 minus 125 whatever it is juice on any other site that you're gambling on bet openly is an awesome way for us to go ahead and save money moving forward check it out Get signed up. And we're going to do another giveaway. We ran the Bet Openly Gauntlet just a couple of weeks ago, guys. And it was awesome. We gave away 300 bucks for first place, 200 bucks for second place, and 100 bucks for third place in a six weeks betting challenge with just a $50 bankroll. The guys that were winning it actually did like really well. So they made a couple hundred bucks in the betting challenge already and then got that extra little sprinkle on the top for the challenge victory, getting $300, $200, and $100 just for participating. It was free. Like I said, you just got to sign up and deposit 50 bucks to play. We're going to do another one. That's going to start at UFC 300. So get signed up if you want to be in on that action. Um, think of it as signing up for 50 bucks and you've got a shot at winning $300 uh, just for competing in the challenge. It was fun. So make sure you get that taken care of and I'll run that on Twitter as usual. Um, let's see here. Steph says it's invalid since latest last episode. Okay. I'm going to talk to the guys. I will make sure to go ahead and get that and uh, we'll get you signed up. No problem. Um, Jay asking if I have a shirt that says I'm an egghead simp that wins one out of every five cars. I'll buy that. Great idea. I'll jump on Fiverr. I'll get somebody to design it and we'll go ahead and get that shirt for you, Jay. Thank you very much for supporting the show and thanks for watching. Um, all right, guys, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next fight of the night. We've got Luis Puello. Puello? Puello? How do you say that, Andrew? Do you know how to say this guy's name? Um, I would <laughs> guess Pajuelo, but Puello. I'm probably not the best guy to ask. Somebody in the chat type out like the the phonics for this, so I don't, so I can correct that. <laughs> and he's taking on my guy Fernando Padilla. Um, we talked about Fernando Padilla very briefly just a minute ago. And uh, I like this kid, man. I'm going to start with the Fernando Padilla side on this one just because I'm a fan. Like I mentioned, called the KO, you know, over Juicy J. Um, he's 15 and 5, 27 years old. And I was just so disappointed in his last fight. I mean, I I'm like all in on this kid. I really like him. I love his frame. I love his build. I like the way he fights. He's a little too low volume at this stage for me, unfortunately. Uh, but He's got good, solid power. He's got good boxing. He's got decent range control. I really thought he was just going to kind of run through Kyle the Monster Nelson. And now Nelson is a guy that I've kind of circled as being a bit of a fade, right? Like we, we don't necessarily want to bank on him, but he's had a bit of a career resurgence. We've kind of sold him a little short as well. He's come through as a decent-sized underdog in a couple of spots. Kyle just kind of figured Padilla out in that last fight and managed to outland him by like about 10 significant strikes. So it was a good fight. It was a close fight. Padilla looked like he was hurting him early and then just wasn't able to keep it up. Um, love the hand accuracy, love the speed, love the forward pressure, and just kind of cooks guys over the course of the fight. One thing I really like is the way he switches ranges and he can kind of switch into elbows once he gets in close. He's always touching up his opponents. Um, I have to shout out Brandon Olivas, you know, guest, a uh, friend of the show comes on every now and again. Um, he actually called that fight being more of a pick 'em, and I was ready to throw Padilla in a parlay at minus 250. He got the cash on Kyle, the monster Nelson. So shout out to Brandon. Uh, we'll have him back on the show soon enough. Padilla is going to have a seven inch reach advantage here in this spot. His opponent, Luis, uh, eight and one, just 29 years old. And he's making his debut off Dana White's contender series. You guys have heard me say that a couple different times tonight. Uh, we talked about that really nasty leg kicks here on Luis. Um, honestly, he was not setting those things up. He was getting countered horrifically. Big power shots coming his way because he was just throwing these naked leg kicks. But it seems like he thrives in a firefight. He's one of these guys that wants to absorb what you're throwing at him, come back and answer with big power shots. Um, good work ripping body shots. He really goes to the body and the legs and he invests in the damage to the lower body and then sets stuff up on top. Good urgency to get up when he gets taken down. He knows he needs to be on the feet striking. And honestly, man, on Dana White's contender series, Robbie Ring is a guy that I've been looking forward to. I thought Robbie Ring was going to be 
the shit. I thought Robbie Ring was going to be a guy that we would really enjoy uh, in the UFC. And he looked good for the first couple of minutes and then just got melted by this guy. It was pretty incredible to watch the way that he just kind of took over. He's a hammer. He gets in there and he wants to throw down. And I don't know that this is the guy you want to do that against. I, I still am on the Padilla train. My stock on him has dropped just a little bit because of that last performance against Kyle Nelson. Uh, and I think Lewis is the kind of guy who's going to bring the fight to Padilla and he's hittable in a way that, you know, Kyle wasn't where he'll be able to land the kill shots that he wants to. I do think Padilla gets back on track in this spot. I think Padilla probably finds his way to a KO. Violence is probably a good look in this fight at some point or another. I have a hard time, the way these two guys fight, seeing it go the full 15. I mean, my guy Padilla is pretty durable, so maybe he stretches it out even in a losing effort the way he did against Kyle Nelson. But this should be a banger of a fight, man. I'm excited for this one. What are you doing here? Yeah, banger of a fight. Um you got Padilla, who came into the UFC, gets Juicy J, finishes him quickly, comes into his next one, looks good for about a round. And, uh, yeah, like you, I think you nailed it when you said Nelson figured him out. But in this matchup, he's fighting Pajuelo, who fun fights, crazy fights. You know, he's going to come forward. He's going to swing for the fences. I don't like his grappling. I don't like his defense. Um, you know, Padilla is longer. He's fought better people. So I, I think he's going to get it done. But I expect fireworks in this one. I think someone's going to get finished. And I think Padilla is probably the one who's going to get it done. All right. We agreed on one. I almost uh, feel like yeah. I I almost feel like I got to bet it. Like the fact that we've been on opposite sides the entire night and we agree on my guy Padilla, like that may just be enough to get me to pull the trigger and, and bet on it because uh, – it has yet to happen all night. That's got to be the one. <laughs> I, I think it's going to happen more often for the main card. I have a feeling. You might be right. You might be right. We'll see what happens, though, right? Um, everybody, it's do cool. me a favor and smash that like button. Like I mentioned before, we migrated over from Pub Sports Radio to Home of Fight here. Uh, so a lot of people are still lost. You wouldn't believe the amount of like DMs I'm still getting from people that are like, bro, Where'd the show go? I can't find you. It's like, guys, I say it every single episode. Go to Home of Fight. Go to the Home of Fight YouTube, for the love of God. <laughs> We're right here. <laughs> Next up, you got Billy Q, and he's taking on Yusef Zalal. Zalal filling in here on short notice, man. And this is, I don't, okay. I, I know this is Friday show shit, but I got to bust the tinfoil hat out for this one because I don't understand this. Billy Q is an absolutely massive fan favorite. He's one of everybody's favorite fighters, right? We all love the guy. He's He seemed like he was putting together a bit of a title run. He's starting to finally get some contender-type fights, and, and that didn't go all too well for one Billy Q. He's got stupid durability. He's got stupid output. I mean, like 7.7 .7 significant strikes per minute coming from this guy. Eight KO wins. Most of those coming in round two or round three because he has un godly weaponized cardio and he just melts people but he ran into the knee of edson barboza o okay all right it happens but i just what is this line man yusef zalal gets cut from the ufc after going on a brutal run he faced Ilya taporia and was favored on the betting line over Ilya when it opened he lost the decision to sung Woo choi and then drops a split to sean woodson they cut him after a draw against Damon Blackshear. Like, this guy has fought closely with everybody he's fought against, and they decide to go ahead and chop him because it's not a pretty run. He rattles off five victories in a row. Now, one of those in boxing, one of those in kickboxing. The kickboxing one was a knockout, by the way. But he finished all three of his MMA opponents. Granted, the last one he fought was 0-0, so I want to put a little asterisk next to that. But he straight up hammered his way straight back into the UFC. And when I looked at this, just... No research, looked at the names, saw Zalal was coming back to the UFC. I went, Billy Q is going to be minus 200. Like, everybody loves him. Everybody's all over the guy. Everyone knows he turns it up. He's going to be minus 200. He was minus 130. And now he's been bet up to about minus 165, minus 170. This smells, man. Like, it just. So it smells like a trap to me, Andrew. It really does. Um, I know that Yusef Zalal is a guy. I don't really rate his power. He, I know he's got four KO wins again on you know these regional bums, 
but he's not much of a knockout threat in my opinion. I worry about the durability of Billy Q. He's taken a lot of big shots recently, and even in his last fight, he was not responding well to the power strikes from Damon Jackson. Damon slowed down, tired out, and it turned into your classic Billy Q fight to get the win there, but he wasn't reacting well to those shots in that fight. He's got an opponent here in Zalal who's going to not go away. Like, Zalal is very, very difficult to get out of there. No one's been able to do it yet. And his cardio checks out. He's on point. He's durable. He can grapple. He's got good back takes. Neither of these guys has good takedown defense. Both of them are floating right around that 60% mark. I kind of feel like Zalal's the side, man. Am I insane? Like, the, the number, the way these two set up, even with him being short notice signed off the regionals without a win in the UFC, the number being close to a pick em, like it just all smells so weird to me. I kind of feel like Zalal's going to squeeze this one out and everybody and their mother is going to be on the Billy Q side and just be stuck holding the CLV trophy because he's going to end up closing like minus 190 or something when everybody got in at minus 130, minus 140. And Zalal's just going to make everybody cry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've, you know, this is a tricky fight for me because I've underestimated Billy Q a lot in the past. Like, uh, it's so funny when I, it's funny now, but at the time it wasn't. I was like pretty sure Alex, Alexander Hernandez was going to beat him. I bet Alexander Hernandez, I watched the fight playing out and I was like, Hernandez is beating him easily. And all of a sudden, like, things just snowballed and the fight was over. I go back and watch the fight every time I tape him and I'm like, Oh yeah, like how would Hernandez not win this? He's so much better. And then every time oh, I watch Hernandez it, had him there too. It's the same result. And I'm like, how does this even happen? But um yeah, Billy Q, great cardio, heart, pace, skill set. It it makes up for his lack in physicality. Um Zalal, you know, he's got some talent, but every time he took a step up in competition, his first stint in the UFC, it didn't go well. I give him a little bit of a pass. He's 27. He was probably like 23, 24 when he got into the UFC. No shame in the Taporia loss. Obviously, you know, he's the champ right now. But the loss is to Choi and Woodson, even though the Woodson fight could have went either way. I bet him against Blackshear. He, he came alive in that third round. It's one of those fights where Billy Q might not have some of those significant cardio advantages he's had in the past. But what I do think is on Billy Q's side is the fact that Zalal likes to kind of dance around on the outside um, at range. I think being in the small octagon, Billy Q might be able to kind of cut him off and make him – Billy Q wants to fight here and Zalal wants to fight here. And I think that because it's in the small octagon, Billy Q is going to you know come forward, come forward, force a fight. So ultimately, I, I do favor him. The grappling exchanges are going to be interesting. I can see both guys looking for takedowns. I think we can see some good scrambles. Um, it, it's a fun fight. I, I have nothing on it right now, but I'll pick Billy Q. It's a real fun fight, man. I mean, once again, you and I picking on opposite sides. I might actually get to uh, a Zalal here on this one. It, I want to see where this line goes, though, because I know without a doubt the amount of love on the Billy Q side outweighs the lols i think i uh, i think jay in the chat is right I, I think this line's gonna get better i think this line's gonna get wider i, I do believe that Zalal is going to be a bigger dog. So I'm just going to sit tight. I'm going to sit on my hands. I'm going to wait and see. I want to listen. You guys know I read way too far into the fighter interviews and like their mentality and where their head's at and all that stuff. I'm going to listen to some fighter interviews and we'll see where this goes. Because if I can get like a plus 160, plus 180 on Zalal by fight time, I probably will pull that trigger, right? At, at plus 120, not quite as interested in flipping a coin, but the wider this gets, the more I'm into that dog money on this. And I, I got to tell you, Andrew, Dixon is very sad that you don't believe in the OnlyFans fade. <laughs> what, Billy Q? Anybody with an OnlyFans. Dixon Dixon is uh, very convinced that anybody with an OnlyFans uh, is the wrong side. <laughs> and, no, I, I don't disagree. This stuff's <laughs> nasty. Yeah. Oh, man. It's uh, it's not been good for them. <laughs> I thought that Moroz was going to be the one to break it because my girl JoJo was hanging it up and – not even that could get it done for her. So there might be something. There might be something to that OnlyFans fade there, Dixon. He keeps proving himself correct. All right, man. Next up, 
the people's main event. We've got Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon, and I cannot wait. I can't wait to hear the keyboards going off on this one, man. I'm going to start this off easy peasy. I'm just going to lay it out there for you guys. This is max bet number nine. Your boy has 7.7 units to win seven on Peyton Talbot at minus 110. So before the breakdown even happens, you know exactly what side I'm on going into this. Now, we cashed what essentially was a max bet on Christian Rodriguez against Peyton Talbot. I was an idiot. It was 6.5 units on C-Rod when they fought, and I should have just rounded it up to seven. So, like, it, it's not on the max bet record because it didn't actually hit the number seven. I'm meticulous like that. Uh, <laughs> but it should have been. It should have been a max bet. It basically was a max bet. And uh, people are, are upset with me that I keep being on the other side of Cameron Simon. A lot of people comparing this to the act actually the C-Rod fight with Cameron Simon, where, you know, the guy with the UFC caliber experience, he's been there a couple times. That's going to be what brings him through. And trust me, I'm the guy that beats that drum week in and week out. I get it. I think that makes a ton of sense. Experience goes a long way and that can ride you through some of these situations. But one of the things I got to remind you guys is Cameron Simon is just 23 years old. I think this kid's got a bright future. Um, he's physically bit of a freak. He's got some decent power on him. He can scramble. He can wrestle. He's got good cardio. And that's all. That's all great. But he is just 23 years old. And his opponent here, Peyton Talbot, is 25. Now, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the whole man strength thing. You know, as you start to kind of grow, um, it, it matters, right? Like your body fills out, your, your muscle fibers thicken. Like that's a real thing. That that's biology. Like you're going to, you're going to get that. And at 25, I know it's only a two year gap, but I could see Peyton Talbot getting maybe a little bit more of that than Cameron Simon. The bottom line for me, man, is Peyton Talbot. I, I just think this kid is special. The way he moves, the quickness that he's got, the way his cardio is just straight up endless like he's another weaponized cardio type of guy i've seen cameron simon get tired i've seen cameron simon slowed down i've seen how hittable cameron simon is he will go he will go hammer for hammer with you and just count on his chin to be the one that holds up but he's been rocked and wobbled in several fights whereas peyton talbot it's hard to touch this kid like his ability to move and skate the outside he's so good and he's got an underrated ground game. People haven't really had a chance to see it. His takedown defense needs some work. I will fully admit that. But his ability to scramble and find his way to top position, that's something that people need to recognize. And he has the filthiest ground and pound, man. I mean, just vicious, brutal ground and pound. And his output is insane. His output is absolutely insane. I've seen some people comparing Talbot in this spot to like Isaac Delgarian last week for example and the big difference for me dulgarian's chin had not been checked at the ufc level dulgarian's cardio had not been checked in fact in his entire career his cardio had not been checked there were big questions about those two items now as it turns out dulgarian's cardio if he makes some adjustments and doesn't go quite as hard i think he probably can do a full 15 minute fight and he'll look better in his next fight his chin sure as hell checked out because he took a lot of shots that a lot of people would have quit to in that fight his submission defense checked out because c rod had a lot of opportunities to finish him and couldn't quite get him out of there like don't get me wrong he got tested but all those questions that we had they failed in his first ufc level fight peyton talbot we've seen go the full 15 minutes and we've seen him get chin checked. We've seen him overcome adversity. So all those question marks that I had on Dilgarian, I don't have on Peyton Talbot. And I think what we've seen from Cameron Simon is just way too much of a willingness to brawl. The blitz attacks where he leaves his face wide open. I think a guy like Talbot is going to have a heyday with that. I just think the striking difference is going to surprise people in this fight. I think, as usual, Peyton Talbot is going to extend his lead the deeper this fight gets. He might give up an early takedown or two, but he will end up landing on Cameron Simon, and I think Cameron's going to have a hard time answering back. Peyton's going to have a three-inch reach advantage in this spot, and I think people are going to wake up to what Peyton Talbot potentially could be in this spot. I'm taking a bit of a leap of faith here. My own angle says that I should probably be on the other side. And I know you guys can hear the dogs barking in the uh, in the house over here. But the fact of the matter is, Peyton Talbot is the one that opened up as an underdog. Now, as of the show, 
He is a favorite. I got him at minus 110. He's sitting up at minus 165 at this point. But as the line opened, guys, he was going to be my Link Memorial Dog of the Week. I was all primed and ready to go that this is going to be my dog for the night. But now he's the favorite on the show. So I can't use him as the dog of the week. I bet him at minus 110, which is a pick em. So I'm going to have to fish for another dog this week because of that. But I'm taking my dog barking as a sign that the line opener is the right side. And I'm on the right side. And I know that's twisting the rules a little bit, but I don't care. It's my show. Andrew, what are you doing in this spot? Are we agreeing? Are we disagreeing? Can we make it two for 11 on this card? What do you like here, man? Dude, is it me? I think the last time I was on here, you had a max bet. Is that am I right about that? Do you remember what the last one was? I'm trying to remember. When was the last time? Do you remember the last card that you were on with me? No, but I remember I asked because I remember asking you about what your past ones were, and you had mentioned like Volkov as well. Like I just kind of remember we had that talk about yeah. it before. So I feel like what do you remember like your last couple? Um. So the last one that I oh it was Jiri. It was Jiri against Pereira. Was I here for that episode? It's possible. I don't remember. That might have been it. Because usually we it, we do do a lot of the pay-per-view cards. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's cool being here for another one. Um, I, I'm going to pick Talbot here. I think he yeah. has a he, he has some cheat codes at 135 pounds. First of all, he's huge for the division. He's like 5'10". His cardio is great. His – his volume's great. The concerns for me on the Talbot side are sometimes he's a slow starter. Like he dropped round one in his last fight. He dropped round round one in his contender series fight. And in the first round, um, if you're dropping round one in the three round fight, you're kind of narrowing your wing condition a little bit. Um, I, I'm not sold on either of these guys as a grappler. Simon on the other side, he's a, he's a pretty good striker, I think, but I just, you know, when Talbot lands, I think he's going to be landing more meaningful power. Absolutely. And it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times you get these volume strikers that, you know, they kind of just pepper you, pepper you, pepper you. But I feel like when Talbot lands, like he lands some some force. So he carries power even late into fights with his volume. And I, I just think he hits harder than Simon. He's bigger than Simon. Um and even though, like, I bet C-Rod against Simon, too, and I kind of expected him to grapple easier but struggle a little bit more striking. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm picking Talbot here. I, I'm definitely not as confident as you are, but th that's what I think is going to happen. I think he wins, um, you know, just landing the more impactful shots. I think he has a little bit more finishing upside. UFC 295. Would, would you look That's at that? Amazing. Vikings jersey. <laughs> Hell yeah. You called it, man. Great memory. Great, great memory. Um, and yes, it was the uh the Jerry Prohaska unfortunate seven unit play that went down in flames. That could have um, that could have hit just as easily. Yeah, I mean, I knew I was getting into a coin flip with that one. I, I knew I was counting on him to land first in that spot and just uh we ended up on the wrong side of what was a hell of a fight for what was, you know, do you remember what the line was for that fight? Uh, yeah, it, Jiri was like plus 115, I think, when I bet him. Okay, yeah. I, I feel like I – I mean, I had nothing on the fight, so there's really no bias for me, but I feel like I'd have Jiri the favorite in a rerun. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm – honestly, if they run it back, I'm going to do it again. And you know what? I it, We're taking a bit of a tangent here, guys, uh, because of the way the conversation's rolling, so I will get right back um, to, you know, the, the Twitter civil war of the week here on this uh, Talbot and Simon card for you. But I do want to point out real quick, because you guys know that I have just gone to war time and time again with my hot takes, and I'm willing to do that, and I'm willing to do it time and time again. And I agree with you, man. If they ran that back, I would have Jiri again, and I had no problem having him a max spec last time. And I'm going to max bet my guy, Jamal Hill, when he takes on uh, the champion at UFC 300. In fact, if you guys love me, and just want to see me have some fun, then you can go engage. And if you hate me, and you want to see me get my ass kicked, then you can also go and engage, because I planted my flag, my guy. I have posted a tweet, and I said for every like that this tweet gets, I will put a $1 bet up on Bet Openly, my sponsor, and I'm going to put that at plus 100, even money. Right now, Pereira is your favorite at minus 135. 
I will give you even money on Pereira. So I'm going to give you a better line than anybody else anywhere in the industry. And you guys can literally come take the money from me directly if you disagree with me. That's how confident I am on Jamal Hill. I'm going to leave this up for a couple weeks. And then I'm going to lock that bet in on bet openly. And I'm going to put the link up so anybody that wants the other side can take a piece of the best line in the game. And when this line closes at minus 110 on all the bookies, I'll still be offering you a better number than that come fight time at plus 100. So I'm doing it again, man. And it's nothing personal. It's nothing personal against Alex Pereira. Uh, but I just, I see holes, and I think my guy can take advantage of them. Tangent over. <laughs> um, I think I like what you said about Peyton Talbot landing the more impactful and meaningful shots. And I completely agree with that, man. And I think there's just a difference. The way that Cameron Simon closes the range he just leaves himself so open. So if they go one for one, it's going to end up being one for three. Like Simon's going to land one shot and that might be fine, but Talbot's got a brick for a head. He's not going anywhere. Kid's durability is off the charts, but he's fast and he's going to come back with three, four counter shots on that one punch. So the volume side is going to be on Talbot's side and Cameron Simon is a decent wrestler. He's a decent grappler, but that's not the way he wins his fights either. So he might get a takedown or two in this spot, but I don't see him wet blanketing a guy like Talbot. And I don't see him having the cardio to blanket Talbot for 15 minutes. So if we get an MMA fight, the volume and the damage is going to be on the Talbot side. Um, I know you don't feel as strongly as I do on this one, but I'm glad once again, that we picked the same side, man, with the sides that we're picking on, now I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to absolutely have to go back and just bet the ones that were on the same side. On because <laughs> those are those seem to be the good ones on the card, man. <laughs> okay, okay. I like it. So I'm going to have to, after the show, I'm going to have to grab myself a piece of Fernando Padilla. I'm already on Peyton Talbot, and we got a couple more fights to talk about. So guys, go ahead. Yeah. Come in here. Smash the like button for me and go hit that. Go hit my pinned tweet on Twitter. Love me, hate me, whatever you want to do. Go go get a piece. Go get a piece. Come on. Yeah, come get the piece directly from me. <laughs> Next up, Edmund Shabazian returns, taking on AJ Dobson. Oh, boy. So this one's interesting. Now, I've backed AJ Dobson several times. I really like AJ Dobson. I think he's a relatively well-rounded fighter. He can mix in his takedowns. He's got decent power. He's got decent hands. He's got really good hand movement. He moves well. Like, there's not a thing I don't really like about A.J. Dobson, save one. He ends up being a little low volume. He admires his work a little too much. He'll land some shots, and he'll just kind of stand there and stare for a bit. Now, Dobson is 32 years old. So it's not like he's out of his prime or anything like that, but he's you know, he's starting to get there. Like it's kind of do or die time at this point. I almost feel like he's almost a finished product at this stage. Maybe there's a little bit of room for him to improve, but man, you watch a, a couple of those last few fights and, and the way his corner like screams at him to do things and he just straight up ignores them. I'm not sure how much he's going to improve because he doesn't seem to be very coachable out there. And he's listening to guys like, you know, Matt Brown and Mark Coleman, who thank God, by the way, survived the fire blessings to him and his family i feel bad he lost his dog in that whole thing but um sounds like he's back in the gym so cross your fingers mark coleman might actually be in the corner of aj dobson come saturday night um but it's a spot where aj just i, I can see him being out volumed by a lot of guys and he's a guy that i thought had decently solid power but his only KO wins are the first two wins of his career over poor regional competition. In the UFC, he hasn't hurt people the same way I really thought he was going to. And Edmund Shabazian, man, is still just 26 years old. Like, I know we're all kind of sick of the Shabazian experiment. He's one and four in his last five in this spot. But we talk about how fighters need to hit that reset button sometimes. I think, that, I think that's what this is. You know, Derek Brunson, Jack Hermanson, Nasser Dean Imovov. They gave him a break finally when they threw him Dolce, Lungi, and Bula. And what does he do? He finishes the guy. They gave him Fluffy. Man, what the hell was that? Like, what was his camp thinking? Like, why did they sign on the dotted line for Fluffy? Worst case scenario for this man. Edmund Shabazian has great ability and skill and power for about six minutes. <laughs> and then he's done so. Now he's been work. He's a young dude and he's been working hard on his grappling and his cardio. And that shows even the fight with Dolce that showed even the fight with fluffy. It showed he lasted to round three in that fight. Like he's not 
quite as helpless as he was previously, but he's still got a long way to go. Against a guy like A.J. Dobson, though, who doesn't push the pace, who's not some wrestling all-star, or at least hasn't been in the UFC. And I know MMA math doesn't work, but like, look when A.J. Dobson was shooting takedowns on Armin Petrosian. Couldn't get him. Couldn't do a damn thing. Ended up kind of bullying up against the fence, and then they break away and they throw a couple jabs. That's how that fight went. Hadolfo Vieira took Petrosian down with zero effort, man. Like, I, I kind of banked on the ability for Armin Petrosian. I bet on him in that spot. I thought he was going to be able to stuff a couple takedowns or get back up. No chance. Rodolfo wanted him down. He went down. I've got big questions about the effectiveness of A.J. Dobson's grappling in this fight. I think this is very much a layup spot where Edmund Shabazian can get a highlight reel if he wants it. Uh, whether it's him getting a full 15-minute fight because he's facing a guy that's going to not push the pace that'll cause him death gas, and he can actually get a 15-minute victory in, we might see the first decision win of Edmund Shabazian's career because Dobson is tough enough and durable enough to hang around in the fight. But I really think this is the UFC finally throwing a softball to Edmund Shabazian. And once again, with the exit of USADA, I got a weird feeling this guy's cardio is going to improve in the next couple of fights. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I was kind of torn on this one at first because, you know, skill-wise, Edmund Shabazian is good. His issue that he pretty consistently runs into every single fight is that he fades later on in the fight. And, you know, you mentioned that the UFC gave him a, a toss-up match. I, I forget exactly what you called it, but an easier matchup in Dolce. And I know he finished that fight in the second round, but to me it felt like he was even slowing down in that matchup, which like wasn't fought at a crazy high pace. And Dobson, in all of his fights, like his cardio is good. And, um, you know, at this price, it, it has to be dollar pass for me just on the fact that I feel like Dobson wins round three at a high clip. I, I think Edmund wins round one at a high clip. Dobson wins round three at a high clip. So I, I see it being a competitive fight if um, Chibazin can't get him out of there early. But th that's just been the common theme in Edmund's career. Like, I think the Dolce win was the first one. Um, oh, he had a split decision win over Darren Stewart. Other than that, all his wins come in the first or second round. Like, a lot of them even in, like, the first minute, like his contender series fight. First minute, the Jack Marshall fight was a minute and 12 seconds. Charles Bird, 38 seconds. I think the longer this fight goes, the better for Dobson. I think, obviously, you know, Shabazzian's skilled. He could get him out of there early, but I, I like the cardio of Dobson, so I'm going to pick him here. Okay. Man, you predicted we'd be on the same side for the main card, and that's not turning out too well. <laughs> well, we, we both picked Talbot. We, oh, yeah, I guess we both picked Padilla. We both picked Talbot, so I guess we're two and two so far. Wait, we, we've got two. We've got two on the whole yeah. damn card. No, man, I, I do get it. I respect it. I'm not betting on Edmund. I'm not betting yeah. on Edmund. Like, it, it, at a two-to-one price tag, I can't do it, man. But I've got a feeling this is going to be the one. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like he finally gets on track here in this spot. Um, and the fact that his decision prop is only plus 250, like, how gross is that? Like, you've got a guy who can't get out of the second round, win or lose, and his decision prop is plus two. I, I just feel like that's telling. You know what I mean? It's like they're yeah. kind of setting this one up. It's a guy that's not going to press the issue. It's a guy that's going to let him reset and catch his breath when he needs to. He's going to have a striking edge on the feet. And this guy's not a good enough wrestler to take him down. So I, I do think this one ends up getting its way to decision. And it's a little bit gross. But yeah, tough, <laughs> tough, uh, tough sledding if you're trying to lay minus 200 at this point uh, with a guy like Edmund Shabazian. Um, yeah. Next fight up man co-main event i can't believe i just said those words your co-main event this evening ladies and gentlemen is carl williams and justin taffa now the taffa bros pulled the old switcheroo on us and this was supposed to be carl williams and junior taffa but we get justin instead fun times fun times in the ufc the way they're just kind of throwing these things around these days um justin taffa the bad man himself. He's just 30 years old. Again, I thought he was a little bit older. I know the other Toff is younger, but I thought Justin was like 33 or something like that. So interesting that he's just 30. He's on a three-fight win streak. You know, you had that uh, unintentional eye poke, the no contest with Austin Lane, and then he <laughs> he rectified that with a first-round KO with a massive hook straight out, of, straight from heaven, man. That guy, that guy was dead on the canvas floor. Justin Toffa's power still just absolutely terrifies me. There's not a whole lot else to talk about. 
The guy is a big old thick boy, and he just walks his way forward. I mean, literally, carelessly walks at his opponent, doesn't set anything up, and wings hammers. If you get even close to him, he's just looking to crack. And unless you've got a hell of a chin on you, he's going to flatline you. That's all this guy does. Carl Williams is almost the exact opposite. Um, he is a little bit older, again, than I expected. He's 34, but he's a dang good wrestler, man. And he's got 15 minutes worth of cardio. This guy puts on a hell of a pace. And the way he took down Brejki like 27 times in that fight, I thought Chase Sherman was in for a bad night at the office. And he was. However, Carl Williams showed us that he can actually box in that fight. He showed off a real nice jab. He showed off some sick combinations in that fight. I was really impressed with Carl Williams striking against Chase Sherman. Granted, it's Chase Sherman, but it was a skill set that I wasn't aware he had to that level at that point in his run. So I'm impressed with Carl Williams at this point and his well-rounded skill set and nature. This is a really tough fight for me to bet, like every other fight on this card, because Carl Williams is a minus 175 favorite. And... I'm not sure if he's going to get the takedowns against Tafa or not. Like uh, all, everything says he should, right? Everything says he should. I know Tafa's got a hundred percent takedown defense rating, but that's on two attempts. He's stuffed literally two takedowns in the UFC. So if Carl Williams gets in there and really wants a takedown and really chains it up and switches from a double to a single, like it, there's a lot of things that he can do differently that opponents facing Tafa have simply not had the opportunity to do. And if he does those things, he probably gets takedowns, and Tafa's uh, fake 100% takedown defense rating gets exposed here. But the way he slowed down in the Chase Sherman fight, I know he threw a lot of strikes, but my guy Chase Sherman was coming for vengeance in that third round, man. He hit him with some big shots. He hurt him a couple of times, and Carl Williams was huffing and puffing trying to catch his air in that spot. And that's what concerns me here. I know Tafa is very much a front-loaded fighter, but if this fight gets extended and Carl Williams slows down, I think Tafa could get a late finish as opposed to an early finish. Man, it I'm so terrified of this fight. I'm going to pick Carl Williams. I'm going to take the coward's way out. I'll pick the favorite. But will a Tafa nuke surprise me whatsoever in this fight? Not even a little. Not even a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I'm in a similar boat to you, Williams. I was I was kind of hoping for like, I don't know. When he first got to the UFC, I was like, okay. He out wrestled Jimmy Lawson on the Contender Series, and most people don't know who Jimmy Lawson is, but he was like a New Jersey wrestling legend. He was like a three time state champ as a heavyweight. He was athletic as could be. Like he he did a backflip after he won a state championship as a heavyweight. Like he literally land in a backflip like that just speaks to how athletic he is but he was so you know he, he was adamant about playing football in college instead of wrestling neither here nor there point being that when i saw carl williams go on the contender series and out wrestle jimmy lawson i was like oh my god i was like i, I couldn't believe it and you know he got into the ufc he out wrestled brzezki he had to work hard to do it chase sherman fight he didn't have as much success with the wrestling still got his hand raised you know He's not a great striker, and Tafa does carry some serious power. But when I look at Tafa's resume and who he's fought, like he he people don't realize this when they talk about Tafa, but he had lost three out of four to Jorgen De Castro, Juan Adams, Carlos Felipe, and Jared Vandera. And he was probably on his last okay. leg in the UFC when he <laughs> beat Harry Hunsucker, Parker Porter, and Austin Lane. And you know, Carl Williams, I I honestly think his last three wins are against people as good or better than that. Like Jimmy Lawson, really good wrestler. Brzezeski, you know, I, I think he has a much better process than some of these guys that I was just naming. Like he's not a world beater by any means, but he, he's a, he could at least be competitive with some of these guys. Like he, he should have beaten Martin Bidet, who was like a, probably a top 30 guy. Um, and yeah, Chase Sherman, you know, none of us think he's a world beater, but he's pretty athletic, decent takedown defense. I, I think top, I suspect that top off of his back is a fish. I think it could be a little bit similar to like a Mark Hunt or a tie to a Vasa type deal where, you know, Williams might not have to chain that many takedowns together like he did in some of these other fights. Cause I don't really see Tafa like getting back to his feet, you know, once he's, his shoulders are 
back to the mat, I think he's going to have trouble. I don't think the takedowns will necessarily come easy, but I think once it's on the mat, it'll be really good for Williams. That being said, you know, Tafa does have serious power, even though I don't think he's a particularly skilled fighter. It's hard to ignore that power. Uh, that being said, I'm, I'm going to pick the guy with the better process, with the takedown upside, um, who I think has fought in better, sti- harder stylistic matchups and already gotten his hand raised. That's fair, man. That's fair. And I, I'm with you. I We could very much be in for a Jail 10 Almeida, Derek Lewis type of fight, right? Like if, if he can just get Tafa down, I got a hard time seeing Tafa getting back up from out, you know, out from underneath this guy. And I do like the way he scrambles and switches things up that that first takedown hip thrust from Tafa might be enough. But when he runs the pipe, when he tree tops him, like when he hits those other efforts, I don't think that Tafa is going to be able to keep up with Carl Williams. Um, it's a short price tag. They are definitely respecting the power of Justin Tafa, but I'm with you. I think we got to go with Carl Williams in the spot. All right, everybody. Main event time. Here we go. We've got Amanda Hivas, and she takes on Rose Navajunas. And uh, <laughs> as KO said in the chat, just noticed the tile is botched. And thank you for saying that because it's not Rosa Navajunas. I'm going to have to change that when we get off the podcast. I got to go fix it. Uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, this is a, a very weird fight, man. Both these women are 115 pounders, and they've just kind of shaken hands and agreed to fight at 125. So a bit of a, a weird situation here. Um, you guys know I love Amanda Hibas. She's fun. She's giggly. She's bouncy. She's perky. She she definitely has a good time every single fight. She's got excellent BJJ. She's a good long striker. But I enjoyed fading the shit out of her chin. She is not durable, and she likes to force a firefight. Man, she throws high volume, and she's there to get hit. You look at her last fight, Luana Pinero. I called that one to a T. We were like, we're gonna play Luana Pinero round one KO. And then we're going to sprinkle like the late rounds for Amanda Hebos because Luana is either going to hit her and knock her out in the first round or she's going to gas. And then Rebos is going to get her out of there when Luana's got nothing left to offer. And it, it's like I wrote the book on it. You couldn't have predicted that one any better. Um, but the shots that she took from Pinheiro could have done the trick. We got the Macy Barber KO home. She doesn't fare well at 125 pounds. Now, I know Rose is not a 125 pounder normally speaking, but this girl can crack. I mean, I know we've seen her in some of the most disappointing fight, fights in, in UFC history, especially recently. You know, the man on field row fight, she was outgunned in that spot. She got rocked in that spot, but you know what? She beat the shit out of Furo's leg. And she hurt Furo a couple different times in that fight. It took her a couple rounds to get going and get warmed up, but Rose had her moments in that fight. And I know the Carlos Barza decision happened. It was a thing. We all watched it, unfortunately. Some of us live, <laughs> but I will never forget the Zhang Wiley head kick. Like Rose got some nasty finishing power on her, man. When she goes for it, she's a bit of a head case. That's the real issue for me with Nami Yunus is Rose can be one of the most terrifying fighters on the planet when she shows up in the right head space. And if she doesn't show up on point, she loses split decisions to Carlos Barza. <laughs> like that's that's just the kind of fighter we're dealing with in this spot. So this line I am struggling with because I actually almost jumped in on Rose at minus 180. And it makes me sick to my stomach that by podcast in time, she is now minus 270. Somebody laid an absolute nuke on Nami Yunus before the show started and and i did not get on that line i wish i had played rose when it was closer to a pick because i do think she is the side she's obviously the fighter that has reached that championship caliber she's got that back class and at the end of the day as much as i love amanda he boss this is just a levels game i I believe there's levels to this shit and he boss isn't gonna touch ufc gold she never will she never was she'll end up being a fun exciting fighter and this is a system play for me man I'm going to play Rose by KO. I hope they give me a good number for it. I doubt they will because now everyone has seen what I've been talking about for a long time. But Rose can crack and Hebos cannot take it. If Rose goes for a head kick, I think she's going to put her in the dirt. Yeah, they've got Rose by knockout at plus 170 on Bet Online, So they're on to me. Uh, but I think Rose finishes in this spot, man. I really think Rose is going to come in here 
and that extra weight may add extra power for her. If she's wobbling people with skills like men on field row, I think she can bury somebody like Amanda Heboss on the feet. And even if this thing does hit the ground, Heboss might on paper have some kind of an advantage, but Rose's ability to scramble in her submission grappling is really top tier and championship caliber. I don't think that's that big of a gap or anything like that for them. So I'm struggling to find where Heboss has that many advantages in this spot. And I really think Rose gets it done. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting fight. You know, I think that... It, I'm trying to think of how to word this because I want to say it properly. Like, I don't think Rose is overrated, but I also think that, like, maybe her run was a little fortunate for a bit. Like, you know, she had the Zhang knockout in a minute. The second fight could have gone either way. The Andrade fight that was a split could have gone either way. Like, the other Andrade fight, she got slammed on her head. Um, the Esparza fight was a joke. They literally didn't fight. And, you know, I, I don't put too much stock in her losing to Fiero because I think that's a solid fighter, you know, up a weight class mm-hmm. for Rose. He boss, I think probably is a cardio edge here. I think she's the better grappler. Um, can be chinny at times, can be hittable, but like, I also don't really put too much stock into her losing to Macy Barber the way she did because they kind of just turned into a firefight and Barber's physicality is a lot different than Rose. I think this being a five round fight favors he boss. Um, so, yeah, it's a good fight. I, I do think the line's wide. Um, I, I expect to finish here. I think if Rose Rose could potentially get an early knockout, but I think if she doesn't, you know, it could, it could smell trouble past that. Yeah, with this being a five-round fight, man, I've got a hard time seeing it go the full distance in this spot. And yeah. I know it's women's MMA, but uh, I do think that's going to be like a levels type of spot. Unfortunately, with the way this line has gone, I would have loved to have taken a piece at minus 150. I would have loved to have snagged a piece of minus 180. I'm going to have to play inside the distance here on this one. Oh, my God. Dixon Sider coming in here saying, he boss has an OnlyFans. So the fade is back in order for this spot. Rose is obviously the side. Thank you, Dixon Sider. Um, Yeah, man. I'm going to have to buy that inside the distance. And if Rose wins by decision, I'm just going to throw up in my mouth a little bit. But I think she's the side. I think she gets it done. I think she gets done by KO. Uh, but I would hate to miss out, you know, if, if inside the distance is like minus 110 or plus 110, something like that, and the KO is plus 170, that's not enough juice for me to justify losing a bet. So I'll play inside the distance on this one, I think, and we'll see where this thing goes. But yeah, I, I think Rose kind of reminds everybody here on Saturday. Cool. All right, guys, that is UFC Vegas. 89 and we are under the two hour mark for you just as promised andrew my man thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for talking fights with us we always have a good time we have identified two count them two winners that we agree on here on this podcast this evening that might be a record the most important one for you for sure exactly the most important one i was like i was shaking in my boots the way we weren't agreeing (laughs) that when it came to my max you'd be like bro what are you doing like so i'm very glad that we agree on that one um but this was uh this was a fun show, man. Obviously, I like we're on the same page a little bit better, but it was already a low volume card for me, so I'm okay with that. Um, if you have anything going on, uh, places where people can support you, any other content you're putting out this week, floor is yours, my man. Let the people know where they can find you and how they can support you moving forward. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me on. I always have a good time. Um, you guys make sure to like this video, and my Twitter is at bets and picks MMA. Everything else I do, you can kind of find from there. So. Thank you, Clint, for having me. Thank you guys for tuning in, and good luck this weekend. Ah, that's there you go, man. There you go. That's good stuff. Get out there. Follow this guy. Make sure you give him a nudge on social media. He's a good guy to have around. And uh, Jay, how nice of you. Clint's actually on point other than Talbot. Are are we going to be friends, Jay? We're going to be friends. I can feel it. It's coming around. It's coming around. I got you, buddy. All right. That was UFC Vegas 89, guys. This is the home of fight. Please make sure you sign up here. I'm going to get a new Discord link, and I'll post it in the description below. One that works. I'm going to reach out to my people. We'll get that figured out for you guys. Um, So come hang out with me in the Discord. Make sure you guys be careful. Protect your units on this kind of a card. Don't blow your wad. There's awesome fights coming up here. And uh, just make sure you're not overextending on some of these sketchy, sketchy, sketchy spots. Let's go dumpster diving this week and have a good time. Um, That's all I got for you guys. It's been a wild start to the year, man. We're already three months into it somehow. 
the time is flying. January felt like it took forever, but here we are all of a sudden. And uh, my anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks, so I need a couple of winners, you guys. I can't be dragging my tail in, you know, into the anniversary weekend with the wife. I got to be able to smile. So send the luck my way. I'll send it right back. I promise. You guys get out there, kick some ass. Love you all very much. Let's roll.